track in the spring over the church has always done a great job. When I heard two songs in there that he sang and I don't believe I've heard him sing before, why they were beautiful. And I thank God that he has given the Sims Church of God such a wonderful talent that he's given. Amen. We've got a few here that can really sing. I appreciate that, but that's not all the town of life. Some of it uh, in teaching as well, and the Sunday school teachers, some of this leadership abilities that he grants, these are all good talents. He's given us all of those as well. I also thank the Lord for you this morning. It's so good to stand up here and look down and see you on a dreary, cold, wintry day such as this is. But even though it is such, we still have the sunlight of his love warming our souls this morning. Amen. Oh, you're old supply. Amen. Well, without any further ado, if you have your Bibles, let us turn to Romans chapter 13. I think we've been awful lot said this morning about doors. He was implying that when he said, come on down, Bob Barker used to say that, and when you got down there, of course, he usually has about three or four doors up there that you chose from. The church, you've only got two doors to choose from this morning. The door of Jesus Christ, because he said, I am the door. For the door of the world. There's only two doors. So uh, you might want to choose this morning which one of those doors you want to pass through. In Romans chapter 13, we'll look at two verses of the scripture this morning, verse 11 and verse 12. And that knowing that the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. I'd like to talk to you a little while this morning on church. Time is running out. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you again this morning that you have indeed given us this wonderful privilege of awaking and seeing a brand new day, but also to come into your house where we could draw nigh to you. I pray, Father, that you would send that great human of power upon us in the presence of your Holy Spirit, that he might lead us and guide us down these pathways that lead us to glory and eternal life. That, Father, we, by that same means, would have that power to spread this good news wherever we go, and that the sunlight of your Son's love shine through each one of us in such a way that would warm the souls of an individual. Now, Lord, I pray, have your way in this service this morning. I thank you in advance, just as Jesus thanked you before he performed that great miracle of instilling life back into the dead carcass of Lazarus. I also thank you in advance for what you're going to do in this service this morning, that you alone might receive the glory and the praise and the honor, for it's in Christ's name I ask it. Amen and amen. I was talking to several individuals this past week that came into the shop, and they were talking about how quickly time passes. And then Brother Luke got up here just a little while ago and said almost the same thing. Time does travel rather quickly, doesn't it? I mean, here we are already halfway through a new month and a new year. My, where did yesterday go to? Well, it's in the pages of history, church. It's like water is spilled upon the ground. It's gone. It cannot be recalled and reused again. But I'm wondering... As we discussed those things in the shop, and I heard Brother Luke say what he did, could this valuable thing called time be running out for us? Church, are we reaching the culmination of all things? Is everything drawn to a conclusion? Are we close to the time when the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, as it states in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4.16? Are we close to the time when we shall hear the heavens pass away with a, with a great roar, a great noise, and the elements melting with fervent heat according to 2 Peter 3 and 10? Are we close to the time when we hear the sounds of Armageddon? And I'm hearing an awful lot of saber rattling here in our news lately, hello? And are we approaching that time when we, the sounds of Armageddon gets louder and louder according to Revelation 16 and 16? 
Or are we approaching the time when the Lord shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very great valley, so that one half of the mount shall withdraw northward, and the other half, half southward, as written in Zechariah 14 and 4. There are some things that are happening right now that have caught my attention and I'm hoping and praying that by the grace of God they've caught yours as well. This, these things, these occurrences that go on on church, they have given me a real feeling that time is running out and that blessed hope will suddenly and soon appear, praise God. What are some of these things, Pastor, that you're talking about? Well, one of these things is the increase of violence and lawlessness. I believe you'll agree with me that we've never seen so much violence in all of our life as we're witnessing today. The disciples asked Jesus one time, they said, Lord, what shall be the signs of thy coming? And Jesus said there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and the stars, and on the earth the nations will be in anguish and troubled at the roaring of the people. Church Paul said that there would be worldwide lawlessness. He tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, there will be terrible times, and most of my scriptures that I'm going to give you this morning is taken from the New International Version, by the way. A little bit easier to understand. He said there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, haters of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, and then he says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, and immediately he adds this to the back of that, have nothing to do with them. In the United States, right here in this beautiful land that you and I live, there are 35 million victims of crime every year. 20% of all murders committed today in the United States are family related. I don't know about you, but that's frightening to me. My violent crimes are on the increase. Not long ago, there was a there was a woman up in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. She had mur- murdered several of her husbands, and it wasn't until a, a couple of them had passed on that they became suspicious, and they be- started to perform autopsies on these dead carcasses, and they found out that she had been very cleverly slipping poison into their food and this was what was causing them to die. They named her the Black Widow. That's what a Black Widow spider does. Do you know that? After she mates, she'll kill her her mate. Well, that's what this lady was doing. In church, she went to her death in the state penitentiary in North Carolina because of the motive they still don't know today why she did what she did. In another incident, there was a quiet, retired couple in Florida. I believe it was in Florida, if my memory serves me correctly. They were murdered in the privacy of their home. It seems that two young military men slipped into an open window that they found and caught these people unawares in bed asleep, and they slit their throat. And then later they asked these young men, after they showed no remorse in court that they'd done these things, they made a statement. The reason they'd done it was Satan told them to do it. They were obeying his orders. And the father of one of the boys said his son was greatly influenced by a game called Dungeons and Dragons. Church, we must be careful what our young people are getting involved in today. Are you watching them? Are you aware of what they're doing? Amen. Violence is not just local. We, we see it every day. My son's in the police department and he comes and tells me all kinds of things that has happened. Violence, the full violence. You hear it on the news. You watch Channel 10. You hear all of them, Bob Griff and some of the others, telling about all the violence that's happened right here around uh, in Mobile, Alabama. Hey, 
Sim, you're not ex exempt from this. It happens right here in our own neighborhood. It happens up in Wilmer and Fairview. Violence is everywhere, friend. But it's not just local. It's worldwide. Not only a violence and lawlessness in the family and in the schools and on our campuses, but among nations. The lack of respect for law and order plagues the international community. While I'm standing here this morning talking to you, this is going on. We can't even go overseas to visit another foreign country. Tourism, my friend, has become a very dangerous endeavor. I mean, we get on so aboard that ship because terrorists, they don't hesitate to kidnap citizens of another country and hold them for ransom. My innocent people are terrorized by these lawless groups throughout the world. Fear strikes into the hearts of people every time they travel to another country. They get on board that airplane and they're wondering, hey, I wonder, am I safe? Is there a grenade or is there a bomb or is there a terrorist on this plane? We screen and we check and we run radar tests. We're in search of the lawless, the, the brutal, those who have no respect for the rights of other people. These things all indicate, church, that we are coming down to the end. And here's something you may not be aware of, but I stay on top of it. We have seen in our own time how the Soviet Union government has seemingly faltered and failed. Don't let the devil fool you for a minute. The Soviet Union is still alive and well. That communistic movement is still there. The Bible this morning is very clear about Soviet intervention in the Middle East just prior to the end of the age. The Old Testament prophet Ezekiel Church describes the full-scale attack by the Soviets on that little nation of Israel. His prophecy reveals an attack on Israel that will be international in scope. Israel's enemies will come not from Iran, not from Iraq, not from Afghanistan, no, not from the neighbors round about, no. The enemy of Israel is going to come from the north. And if you know anything about Bible prophecy, every time the Bible speaks about north of Israel, you can take your ruler out, put it on a map, and draw a line and lead right straight to Russia. Ezekiel says they'll come from that north, and the Bible gives us warning in Ezekiel 39, 1, 2, and 4. He says, I am against you, O God, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn you around and drag you along. I will bring you from the far north and send you against the mountains of Israel. On the mountains of Israel you will fall, you and all your troops and the nations with you. Every time church of the Bible says uh, about north again, it's that great bear that lies directly to the north. And when he speaks here uh, about Meshach, that is the, uh, the name that Moscow is derived from. You have Bible telling you what's going to take place. Amen. And I'm seeing things now that's occurring on a worldwide scene that makes me shudder. Damascus area. I don't know if you, again, if you know where that little country is at or in that city. But in Damascus, Syria, it's a stronghold of the Soviets. The Soviets control virtually the entire military operation in Syria. They don't run the Syrian army, but they have advisors there that make themselves very evident. And the Syrians have positioned themselves over there in the Becca Valley in Lebanon. The Israelites continue to make strikes against these forces and the media gets on and, and gives them a ride for their money, downgrading them for all of these things. But my friend, Israel has an apparent reason for her motives in this military action. It is this. It's to strike the Soviet surface to air missiles which are present there in the Becca Valley. Now let me tell you what was told recently by an Israelite. In 1973, that seemed like a long while ago, but it isn't all that long, but in 1973, during the Yom Kippur War, the Syrians with hundreds of their tanks and thousands of men made their way into the Golden Heights. It was Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is, my friend, the Jewish Day of Atonement. And it was during this time when they were all celebrating this. Most of the people of the Jewish region were, were observing that day of atonement. But Captain Devi Zvecha, amen, went to the Golden Heights. There was only 120 Israelite border guards on duty that day and 20 
unmanned tanks. Have you got the picture? Mine all of a sudden, Levi, that guy looked over and he saw a cloud of dust coming up. And in his mind, it immediately thought, here come the Syrians, I've got to stop them. And so were he and his one little tank. All it was was his driver and himself in one tank. They went out to face this seemingly approaching Syrian armored force using their tanks. But as he got closer, he saw that they weren't Syrians at all. They were Soviet tanks. He was wondering how he could he stop all of this. And so that one little tank with one driver and himself, and they went from the side of the mountain to that side of the mountain, this side of the mountain, that side of the mountain, knocking out one tank right after the other until those Russian soldiers were wondering how many Israelite tanks are there out there. He had to keep them held up until help finally could arrive. Mine, it wasn't long after they began to slow up the approach by knocking out one tank after another, help finally did arrive. And friends of the Israelite army finished demolishing the rest of them. A hundred tank drivers of the Russian forces jumped out of their tanks and ran for their lives. God somehow supernaturally used one little tank, amen, to defeat a whole armored division of the Russian army. If you were to go to northern Israel right now, you get up in the northern part of Galilee, you'll find a monument there. It's the tail section of a jet airplane, an Israelite jet airplane. It's a monument to those men who fought who destroyed the Syrian stronghold that was there around the, the, the mountains of Galilee. The Syrians had set up a fortification over northern Galilee. They would set up artillery, uh, 155 howitzers or, or even better along there, and then they would set up uh, uh, rocket launchers or missile launchers. Uh, and the, one of the men that was in there, he was a he was an Israelite spy. He convinced the Syrian army. He said, hey, what you need to do is plant eucalyptus trees everywhere you've got one of these uh, 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 artillery pieces or, or a rocket launcher. They will give them shade from the sun and from the heat. And so the Syrian army listened to him. And he, they put planted eucalyptus trees uh, all around the, the artillery piece and around the, the rocket launchers. And then Eli Khan, who was the Israelite spy, sent word back to Israel. He said, Hey, uh, everywhere you see an eucalyptus tree, bomb it. And this they did, and they was able to take back, amen, all that terror, that recapture that area. And today, when you talk to an Israelite uh, Soviet about a Soviet involvement, uh, they will tell you very quickly, we know we're not fighting against the Arabs alone. And then it's not just the Syrians. It's not just the Libyans. No, it's the Russians. We know we're up against that uh, church. They sense their presence uh, they know they're there. They know they're fighting against somebody big. They have to keep on guard all the time. We are living in the last days. Time is running out, church. Another one of the signs is that life is coming back to dead places. I mean, there's a beautiful picture when Ezekiel 47 where he says this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah where it enters the sea. When it enters the sea, the water there becomes fresh. Ezekiel said that the dead sea shall live and that creatures will live in it. Great numbers of fish fishermen will be able to stand on the banks of the sea and throw their nets out and catch an abundance of fish in the Dead Sea. Right now there's nothing living there. A few little saltwater shrimp, but that's about the essence of what's in the Dead Sea. That's why they call it the Dead Sea. Hello? Oh, but Israel has already started to, amen, some years, it's been about 20 years now, they started building the canal that goes from Jerusalem to the Dead Sea. Lord, church, are you listening? When that fresh water comes out of Jerusalem, it's in the dead, dead Sea. It's going to cause things to come back to life. Amen. There it is. Oh, hallelujah. The desert in Isaiah 35, one says the desert and the perched land will be great. The Bible says that the wilderness and the desert shall actually be glad and rejoice with joy and singing. This is a sign of the end church. The valley of Armageddon has been nothing but swamp land for years and years and years. For thousands of years as it were. Amen. But now this land is some of the most fertile, some of the most productive ground. Amen. Trees and flowers and food abound. Israel has become one of the leading exporters of flowers and, and fruits and vegetables. It's the third largest Exporter of 
exporter of roses and the world's leading exporter of the Jaffa orange that we love so well. Church, Israel just recently reported an overabundance of rainfall during the month of January. Even they are astonished to see even the hills starting to turn green all around them with the green grass. And when you look over those green hills, amen, and see the baldy colored flowers blooming all over there, you can almost hear the hills and the mountains rejoicing and singing just like God's Word said in Isaiah would happen. Hallelujah. We're living in the end. But the one thing that really draws it up for me and let me know for sure and for certain the time is running down is the lack of expectancy in the body of Christ. Jesus said that the time would come when men would not expect the coming of the Son of Man. Matthew 24, verse 44. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect it. The Lord also said this in Luke chapter 21, beginning to verse 34. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with drunkenness and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Church, we read this morning over in the book of Revelation, chapter 16, verse 15, where he said, Behold, I cover the thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together in a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Oh, church, the Lord would have us to know that just prior to Him coming, amen, just before time runs out, just before the end of the dispensation of grace, it, He's telling you and I, my, that just before all of this, all over the earth, there will be men and there will be women who will not expect the coming of the Son of Man. But you say, oh, Brother Jim, how can that be possible? Any appalling thing is now occurring, church. I've seen it happening right now all over this land of ours. Ministers, preachers who once stood behind pulpits such as I'm standing before and fervently preached about the coming of the Lord are not preaching about it anymore. Pastors and preachers are beginning to talk about the rapture as if it was just a mere theory, not a promised fact. Church, when we play into the hands of Satan, when evil thoughts keep us from watching for Christ's return at Jesus' ascension, if you remember over in Acts chapter 1, verse 1, the angels came there and said, Ye men of Galilee, while you're standing looking up into the sky, this same Jesus who has been taken away from you into heaven will come in just the same manner as you have seen Him go. Hallelujah! Oh, Billy Graham even stated, my friend, that he believes the world is coming to an end socially, uh, technologically, and physiologically. I believe this not just because what Billy Graham said, neighbor, but from what Jesus said, time is running out. While I've been talking to you this morning, I'm wondering, can you feel a tug on your heart this morning? Or have you gotten so cold and indifferent to the coming of the Lord? Do you sit there and ask in a tone of unbelief, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Church member, Christian, saint of God, have you forgotten? From whence He has brought you from? And have you gotten to the point where you think, well, Brother Jimmy didn't come yesterday, and he probably won't come today. Hmm. Because of that, have you grown cold in your witness to the Lord? For the Lord? Do you think, oh, preacher, I've got plenty of time. Listen, if you've come to such a place, I ask you not to lose hope. Keep your eyes upon the eastern sky. 
And when these things, Jesus said, and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your head for your redemption. Draw it nigh. Church, time is running out. Are you ready? Oh, this could be the day. Hallelujah. This could be the day. Jesus will return. Because another one of the signs is a great fall of the way. The love of men will wax and cold. And fall. You're seeing everything happening right now. You know that we've got people over in Iraq searching for atomic weapons of mass destruction. I don't know if they'll find anything or not because Saddam Hussein said plenty of time had him. But because of his reluctance to reveal anything, we're about ready to go to war. More and more of our young men are being shipped overseas every day. Even while I'm talking to you this morning, there's a bunch of them getting on board of a boat being sent over there. That's one thing. Church, another thing is that North Korea has dropped out of the atomic proliferation program. And now they're going to start increasing their atomic capability, their nuclear capability. And I don't trust North Russia as far as I can see. I'm mean North Korea. You tell us one thing and all the while, you've got a knife in the other hand ready to stick in our back. But you can't trust it. She gets those nuclear capabilities and knows what'll happen. Even that, as frightening as it is, doesn't concern me too awfully much, but I'll tell you what does. It's that bear who's being very quiet. You don't hear too much about it. Russia. What is she doing? What's happening behind the scenes? According to the Bible, she's getting ready to march down on the little nation of Israel. Are we going to be there to help her? Not according to the scriptures. Something's going to happen to America that's going to knock her out of being a superpower. We won't be there to help Israel. All of this is so close. So very, very, very close. I'm not telling you this to scare you to death. I'm not a doomsday preacher. I'm giving you the Bible and the facts of life. Time's running out. Before these things will occur, Jesus is going to come and get his bride. He's not going to allow any harm to come to her. He's going to protect her. He's going to take good care of his bride. He's going to come get her and take her home. Speaking about the church. But how many of us this morning are we ready? If he should come within the next few minutes, would you go to meet him? Or would you go home this afternoon and find that things are not exactly the same way you left them? Everything seems to be in confusion. You turn the news on and it just seems like everything is going and turned into a, a world of havoc. I don't know like that, huh? But the fact remains that Jesus is about ready to come. I sense it in my spirit. And I believe you can tell by the way I preach, I believe every word I'm saying. And I do. But how is it this morning between you and God? head bowed and every eye closed. Everybody, every saint of God that knows how to pray, pray. Lord, send your Holy Spirit to that one that they may be convicted of their sin and call upon the name of Jesus. That's the way I want you to pray this, this morning, saints of God. Have that compassion for the lost. Be overly concerned about them who have yet to realize Jesus died for them on God's office. While you pray, no one moving, no one looking around. 
standing right there when you slip that hand up. Brother Jim, I'm not ready. If Jesus should come right now, I wouldn't go. I know it in my soul. I know it. I don't want it to be like that. And I know that the only way that I can erase that problem is to invite Jesus into my heart. Would you slip that hand up? I want to pray the sinner's prayer. That's how you feel this morning. You're not ready. You're not prepared. And I'm not just talking to you. I'm just talking to you. I've given you the truth. So help me, God. How about you, saying to God? I didn't see any hands go up in salvation this morning, but how about you? Is it all right between you and God? There's no doubt in your heart. He can come this morning. Go with me again. Because there is, if there isn't any shadow of a doubt there, you'll never go. That thing that has that seed of God planted there before you die. Out of time. Call upon me. I do every day. I say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. I'm sorry for my sins. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me for my faults and my failures, my shortcomings, my misgivings. Forgive me of those things, Lord. Because when He comes to church, I want to be ready. I don't want nothing to be be between my soul and my spirit. You're not like me. Standing right there. I repent of my sins. I'm sorry. Lord, I know I'm tired. Almost as much as as that Roman soldier when he drove those things in your head. Because I have not been obedient. And you call upon my life. Pray like that, church. When you be here this morning, everything will be all right. That's God. Father, I thank you for you have brought us this morning time. Thank you for the words of life that you've given us, the warnings again that you have placed before your people. Lord, I can't see without the scales being fallen from their eyes. So I ask you to apply the hidden bomb of Gilead, spiritually speaking. They might see the truth of what I've just said. And knowing this, that time is running out. That they'll be more fervent in the work of the Lord, getting this message out for the lost and the dying. Lord, make them so winners. Everybody standing here, make every one of us so winners. Hallelujah. Testifying of your goodness and your grace and your mercy. Keep your hand upon them now as we go back to our earthly home. God, I pray that you'll bring them back to each one of the time we can get gather here at your house and draw nigh to you as you draw nigh to us. I thank you in advance in Jesus.